Man, you ready? Yeah. Concentrate. Let's Concentrate go, with me. Uh, 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 uh. What you say? We do this day by day. Yeah. We live like this cause we got it, y'all. Every day I pray. Yeah. You show me the way. Uh -huh. The way to handle. I said every battle. Uh -huh. And day by day, okay. whatever come my way. Okay. If it don't crush me, make me more lovely. Day by day. I said day here to talk about a very current issue, someone far more important and enigmatic than these characters, the one and only Namdi Okoye. Have I pronounced it correctly? <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're going to turn this. You're normally the guy firing the questions at everyone else, but let's fire some questions at you. Is that okay? <laughs> well, okay. Well, I don't know if I'll answer them, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. But two plus so, two. One, is that what you wanted to know? Oh, what kind of question? Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's make it easy for you to start with. So, obviously, we've mentioned your love of Liverpool Football Club. What, how did that, how did a Nigerian guy come about supporting Liverpool? You should be an Arsenal fan, so how did that come about? <laughs> Tell us where this passion for Liverpool came from. Okay. Um, now, my parents, my dad moved to, um, my dad worked in the ship, Navy, uh, Merchant Navy, so ships from Nigeria to, to the UK with cargo. And um, yeah, so he was on, he was aboard the ship. So his ship moved from Nigeria, went to, to Liverpool, offload cargo. And when he was about to, the ship was about to go back to Nigeria, civil war started in Nigeria in, in the oh, mid sixties. Wow. And so the ship couldn't go back. And so he, he, he was stranded in, in Liverpool. So, I think the war was about two or three years, and so instead right. of sitting at home, he decided, "Well, goodness, what do I do?" Um, he yeah. went to he went to uni in Liverpool, settled there, and and at the time in the '60s, Shankly moved to Liverpool and revived, yeah. uh, revitalized, and and I think in those early days, and um, Liverpool was very much um, Liverpool and Everton are very much divided by religion as well. So yeah. a lot of Liverpool supporters had a and I think you might notice in some in some football clubs they'll they'll have a parish um, like a vicar or or a um, or a faith leader that's associated with the club. Yeah. Yeah. So Liverpool how old, had, had how a, old had were a, you at this time? No, I wasn't born. <laughs> oh, you. This is pre you. Okay. This is yeah, sixties. Sixties. I thought you could have been around. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go on. No. So so I think Liverpool had a, an Anglican vicar and then Everton had a, a Catholic vicar. And my dad being Protestant um, Anglican, I think. And Liverpool were winning at the, in the 60s. I think that's how he, he just started to support the team. My mum yeah. also, um, during the effects of the war, she moved to, 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 to the UK. And um, so my mm -hmm. parents met in Liverpool, got married in Liverpool, settled in Liverpool. And so, yeah, I was born um, in Liverpool in the 70s when, you know, they were just winning. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> your dad supporting the team, they were winning you know what else do you do it but support the well, mighty red so and where's your liverpool accent where's what's happened to that over the years yeah so uh, what you find out is as you get older and travel around the world that um the scouse accent isn't as um it's very unique and can and and, yeah. and it draws quite a lot of attention and um we moved to um we moved to nigeria in the 80s and mm. um yeah having a Having an English accent was okay, but having a Scouse accent, I didn't realize how much it was uh, detrimental to you. Yeah, so it, 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 yeah, it seemed natural to me. I mean, think of Stephen Gerald and Carragher, how they speak, and that's how I was, you know, because I grew up in a place. Can you, always... can you do us an experiment? Read Life Stories Halftime Chat, Let's Talk in a Scouse accent. Oh, no, 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 it doesn't work. I'd be like very that. interested to see yeah, you do I, the Scouse I, accent. I'll be interested if I could do it. No, I think <laughs> uh, uh, the one thing, you know, would say me, me mum. You know, to, but you know, you almost have to be around a little a scouse to, and yeah, it yeah. That becomes natural. But yeah, I think that that was a quick, the first accent to disappear when I got moved to Nigeria to go to secondary school when my whole family relocated to Nigeria. And I, I think I lost it there. Then I moved to mm -hmm. America. So I think in between that, the accent diluted. Okay. Little, so. I'm going to drag you a bit back because you're jumping ahead. Let's go back to this secondary school in Nigeria. Okay. And what was it like being in a secondary school in Nigeria? I don't know anything about education in Nigeria. So oh tell goodness! Me. Um, yeah, so boarding school—that's that's what it's like. Ah. Um, and um, 
I think it's, you know, you, you read, you, you probably read novels of people who go to boarding school and think, oh, boarding school isn't fun. Um, no, it was, it was like military camp, you know. Oh, right. um, if you were a junior, the seniors would be very regimental, you know, you have to get their water, you have to get their food, you have to wash their clothes at times. Um, mm. Yeah, so it was, it was a challenge. It was a challenge. But it was a good bonding experience. I've got a lot of good friends that I still keep in touch with that I from secondary school. Um, yeah, I went to a school called Federal Government College in Lagos. And, and, and um, because it was in Lagos, and Lagos was the, the commercial hub of Nigeria, so a lot of people who went to the school who could get in, um, their parents either were... Well, that had, a lot of parents, you know, were, were well off or, or um, were in the government. You know, I think yeah. you know, we had at one point the governor of Lagos, his son was was in our school in our class. So wow, it was yeah. So so you you went to school with a lot of influential kids of, of influential families, and um, yeah. it was it was great. Yeah, I, I, I didn't take to it like a doctor water, and uh, it was a challenge. But a lot that uh, most people would say has helped them along the way brilliant and so you came so you came out of this school with good results okay results average results or no i um yeah school wasn't great for me um i didn't realize i had dyslexia right so imagine being in, in secondary school and with <laughs> dyslexia uh, and if anyone yeah. doesn't know what dyslexia is it has it's, it's, it's an impairment it's sort of a learning disability where your mm. it affects your memory can affect your ability to read your writing your spelling and so you have this and you're in a school where expectations are high I, and yeah. and where you know so i'm writing and uh, and, I, and i and so in school you get an end of term report and it will list you know there's 30 people in the class and they would rank from who got who's first to who came mm. last in most subjects, I would always be in them. I would always come last, and so you'd get your report card, and you're thirtieth out of thirtieth. And so wow. your parents are thinking, you know, we've sent you to one of the best primary schools, you're in one of the best schools, and you're coming last. What what does that mean? And yeah, I, yeah. you can't understand it. You can't understand why you can't remember, you can't read, and stuff. And yeah. your teachers are writing, he's lazy, he's he's not yeah. motivated, he's you know he will never amount to stuff in your report card, and you're like, goodness, what God is this? So yeah. yeah. So after after leaving school, I think I I managed to pass English. I got a C in English. I got a C in in geography, and I think I just got another C in another lesson less class, um, yeah. maybe maybe uh, home economics or something like that. Um, and at my and I was doing a lot of science. Here here I am, can't remember stuff and can't spell, and I'm doing chemistry, mm. physics, and biology. So I had to reset my gcses um wow uh, and i should imagine this sad from what i know of dyslexia this obviously would affect confidence as well wouldn't it and sometimes it can bring not depression but some anxiety with it and some yeah. you know issues around that did that affect you at that time yeah yeah a very very shy very lack of confidence um if I, if i wasn't if i if if i had to I wouldn't, I would be sitting in the middle of the class. So that means you're not the back. So the teacher won't pick you out. You're not yeah. in the front. You're right in the middle. I was very quiet. So people didn't recognize me. Um, Is there such things as a quiet Nigerian? <laughs> I mean, I was, I was probably one of the ones I'm, I get surprised when people say they remember me from school anywhere, because I was that, that's how I felt that I just had to hide myself, but it was, yeah. yeah I just, knowing that you're going to write the test and you're going to come last you know, it's yeah. without realizing that there was a, such a, I'd never knew what it was dyslexia. And I think it was yeah. tough for my parents too, because they're wondering, my, my youngest, younger brother was an A student, you know, he was doing everything well. And then they look at my stuff and they're thinking, am I just playing around here, not taking stuff seriously? Mm. And uh, obviously you're, um, obviously now as I know you in your later years, you're an articulate guy, seem okay. quite confident publicly. Were, at home, were you presenting as articulate and bright, and then at school when you're writing, it was coming out differently, or were you also lack of confidence as well? So, was so your more articulate, bright side wasn't showing up, or it was at school? Yeah, no, I think at home. Um, so I was very, and I think this is where you know, you, if you understand anyone with dyslexia, I was mm. very creative, very imaginative. Yeah. Um, my dad had um, a video camera. 
so you think about it back in the late 80s early 90s so it's not actually in the mid to mid 80s to have a video cam was very rare and he had a sony yeah, yeah. handycam and so i used to record um you know we go to a wedding or a party and i'm there always recording and i'm editing and and doing the titles and stuff and so everyone knew me as the guy who was always recording and so i was always creative very you know i had three younger brothers and always adventurous and, yeah. and i had some good friends who we lived near so i think at home they could see if there was i was macgyver if you ever heard of what i remember movie, macgyver yeah I, so that was i was very much like that without knowing the show but i was very much of a there's a problem how do i fix it i'm always yeah, yeah. To think outside the box but as i said naturally as part of my dyslexia yeah which is a classic dyslexia trait isn't it to be able to problem solve to think creatively and, and get around problems so it's a massive strength yeah so and, yeah <laughs> you, using your lovely word so what we're we gonna do now you tell me when you jump from one thing to another what's the media expression when you make a nice link <laughs> okay what yeah was a segment kind of thing or what <laughs> a, 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 what did you call it you called it a segue what? A segue or is it so okay yes. yeah okay so we're gonna do a nice segue now so you're, you're this nigerian guy not having done as well as he could have done because of dyslexia at school but obviously mm. not not stupid as some people used to think back in the day right guy you're creative you're getting your camera you're filming a lot of uh, uh, weddings and and then suddenly because i know a bit about your the bits i know about you obviously and that's why i'm wearing this t-shirt <laughs> la the la years does does this jump from here to la or is there a bit between no i mean what because i couldn't get my my gcse's and i had to wait a year in order to redo them in fact yeah. i can remember the week before um writing the the the, the second batch of gcse's um yeah. i um actually I, I, you know i'm writing them I'm, i've written some of the subjects and and i'm writing my maths you know because you need maths and english anywhere in the Obviously. world so i was yeah, doing yeah. the maths and i, I was sick in the maths less in the maths exam and right. um, you know i was really out of it and the um what has been physically sick or yeah just physically Ill? sick yeah was, just, oh, wow. yeah and so the examiner the the invigilator was like this guy doesn't seem well um yeah can he copy he asked one guy that can he just copy your, your maths and stuff so you can finish <laughs> it i just remember them just saying look yeah let's just help him finish this exam some i don't i think i copied somebody's stuff and submitted it Oh, and wow. then this was probably on a Friday. Um, Should you be a, confessing this on a public <laughs> show? <laughs> yeah, right. but this was a, a, a strange enough. I mean, maths is probably one of my strongest suits now. I'm surprised I didn't do it. I probably should have been an ace in maths when it comes to maths. So my brain yeah, yeah. just thinks. I just think it was just the learning environment. But um, I think the next day, I go into I go to hospital. My dad takes me to hospital and says, "Look, what's going on?" Um, mm do a blood test and they they tell my dad you need to bring him in right away because oh. if we keep him a day later he might die and it found that i had um, hepatitis i must have eaten something that's the okay. one when you eat something that and um I don't know that one. so there's there's hepatitis a and b but there's this is the one oh, that, okay that yeah, yeah 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 sorry yeah, yeah yeah when you when you eat something and so they said my livers were failing and you know i'm i was probably you know 24 to 48 hours from death so when I was thrown up and reacting, it was just the fact that, you know, so I'm in a hospital for, so for two weeks, I couldn't eat. So they just put me on a drift for two weeks. And, um, yeah, and this was, yeah, this was to, this was to, uh, yeah, after two weeks, you know, everything was, was, was fine and stuff. So I passed the maths, which is great. I got my five, yeah. five, five GCSEs, but then, you know, you have to take, um, unlike here in the UK where you, um, you do your A levels. Can't cheat in exams. Yeah. Well, you do your A levels, and then you have to yeah. do predictive stuff. Nigeria is very similar to America, where you have to take an exam. In America, they call it a GRE, but you, in yeah. Nigeria, it's called JAM, Joint Admissions Matriculation Board. So it's, you have to do an exam and score. It's over four hundred. So you have to score high to get into university, and so if you have dyslexia and you're not really good at reading and studying, and and you're taking an exam that you need to score high well yeah the likelihood of passing was not there so i've got my papers my five papers but couldn't get into a university and um so at the back of my mind is like you know what could i do um i hadn't done well at all where everyone else was going to all the sort of the premier universities in nigeria i i had to go to sort of a, a university in in a in a rural state 
and it wasn't in a university, it was a polytechnic um, in a state. And so it was a big, you could call it fall from grace. It was disappointing for my dad because my parents, my dad yeah, yeah. still has his report you, cards from primary school. So he was- And your brothers there. are going off, your old brothers going off. Brothers are to going Canada. to premier yeah. universities, all doing well. Yeah, yeah. All the friends are doing that. And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm shipped to a rural state. To, to a state and what, what did you study there? What was the, what were you studying? I think I got an admission to do accounting. Ah. Naturally, that's not my, wasn't my, I mean, as much as I love maths, so accounting was no different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, but it was more like I needed to be in somewhere. Um, yeah. But, um, and also your, your creative juices would not be used necessarily in accountancy, would they? No, no, no. It was just an admission to get into somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah. So the idea then was my. I remember my dad thinking, okay, if you do two years there, two years of of the polytechnic was considered like a, a foundation year, so you can go into your first year into university. And and the, there was a thought at that point was maybe you can go back, come come back to the UK. So I hadn't been back to the UK since we left in the mid eighties. So you know, secondary school. So I was thinking, okay, just do two years get a good enough grade and then we can maybe move you back to the UK so you can go to university and and I thought oh, that's a great idea you know it's um it's um it's you know change of environment might be helpful yeah um so I spent a year there and you know very fortunate to be able to survive a year there it, you know they had so many perils and ups and downs but I managed to survive a year but and after the end of the first year I get home and my my uncle, my mum's um, younger brother, um, who was very close to me and um, our family, um, spoke to my parents and said, you know what, he's got um, a very close friend and cousin who lives in the States. Ah. Um, who, um, they've been, they're really close, very tight, and they, they were talking and, 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 and his friend, his cousin has said, why don't you bring one of your kids and to stay with us and, and go to school. And so my uncle, my cousins at that time, his oldest was a girl and she was still in secondary school and, he, and the other boys were still, were still much younger. And, and my uncle just thought, you know, my, my daughter's, uh, she's still in secondary school. But she, he, always, he considered me, he thought my sister's son, you know, he was, you know, you know bright and intelligent young kid, but, you know, struggling to get around. And he suggested it to my folks. Um, so I come home from, 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 you know, a year, almost like going to, uh, I was going to call a country. I don't want somebody to be offended in another country, but yeah, almost yeah. going to, uh, you know, being in a, in a really tough environment. And my dad yeah. says, what do you think about going to America and, and going to school? Now, I think it was almost like someone saying, how would you like to go to, go to, to the moon or something like that? That's like yeah, yeah. America. That's Disneyland. Yeah, yeah, I'm American. No one. I never thought in a million years I would ever be to America. And I was like, no, that doesn't yeah. make sense. And um, yeah, so that's that's how the opportunity came. And um, yeah, and I'm, I'm just going to stop you for a second because I'm I'm picturing the the movie coming to America with Ed Murphy, <laughs> the Nigerian prince <laughs> rocking up. I in, did you know, use that. Getting in the hot use... tub with his with his assistant, you know. Well, I did. Just... One, um, but mine at the hot tub. But I did use that to uh, to network my way. Of... <laughs> yeah yeah that, so then I'm, I'm so so we've got this guy perhaps, perhaps a little, you know he's had this rough time out in the countryside a bit low maybe on confidence and he's going across to america to stay with his cousins let's go from there we're in america so i moved to a place called selma alabama okay and people will say well i don't know selma now if you're in america no. you might remember selma is where martin luther king had a march because in, in in Alabama, the the, the blacks couldn't vote, um, mm. you know, and so Selma was one of the places. So the mayor of Selma and the governor and the president, it was very much of a, that was the battleground where they decided we need to sign a civil rights act after the, the, the march in Selma. Wow. So I moved there in, in 92 and the mayor of Selma in 92 was the mayor back in 66 and 68. Oh, and where the blacks could vote, so he was still mayor. I'm, I'm afraid wow. Say. So, yeah, um, how he got it, how he still stayed in, only God knows, you know, all these yeah, years yeah. he was still mayor. So, wow. Um, yeah, so, but I remember flying into America thinking that I was, we flew into New York. It was hard. It was the first time I'd, le you know, left the family. And I mm. remember in the airport, I was able to see the whole family. Then my dad was able to 
go with me to, as close to the gates, the boarding gates as possible. And I remember when I turned back and he had to go, it was the first time I felt I'm saying goodbye to the family was the hardest thing. And, you know, get on a plane, arrive to New York. And in my head is America's paved with gold, you know. Mm, uh, land of opportunity. Land of opportunity. <laughs> it was hard fly, driving into New York and hearing, you know, going over potholes and hearing the siren and thinking, this is, uh, you know, this is no different from Lagos, you know. It was, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I moved to Alabama and it, it was, it was it was it was always it was felt like a fairy tale dream for the first couple of years just living and just and, and, and let's go about how, how old are you at this stage what, what age are you? uh because well, 18 or so 18, 18 right, 19 okay. yeah so yeah quite young. yeah still yeah still young um yeah 18 19 first thanksgiving going being in atlanta and seeing just if you watch home alone and all this stuff and I you're watching seen, yeah. all these films and then you, you see them having thanksgiving and seeing the food and stuff and and i stay with a very supportive and loving family that well it helped that we have the same surname so it was easy for people to say oh this is this is our son and my cousin our cousin and stuff so i it, it, I, it fitted in pretty well and yeah. and, and they embraced the american like because they're nigerian i assume yeah yeah but my yeah, so yeah so but my my uncle and, and auntie had been there you know they both went to prestigious universities my uncle was a surgeon and he was a professor so, okay um so the kids were born and raised there so they were they were very much a you know american and yeah. stuff and so you know so it was me who was looking and learning and, and stuff and adapting ah so i want to get on to this um i'm thinking ll cool j and all these top musicians i know you have so when, when does when does namdi get into this this music scene in america <laughs> how does that come about <laughs> When do you become this big fat cat producer and record guy? <laughs> you know, I think no. growing up in Nigeria, I was um, going to school in there. I started getting into the music a lot more as a yeah. you know, listening and, and being able to recognize producers or writers by listening to a song. Say, oh, this sounds familiar. So I started to know the, the producers. So if it's a Babyface, if it's a Teddy Riley or Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, because I could hear the, the similarities with their works across different artists. And, um, and so that, that became more of a hub and a passion. And, um, and, I, and I think I heard about um, people like you know, Puff Daddy, you know, he was mm. in university and he, got a, he was able to get into the business uh, and you know, became, oh, he was the guy who just supported a, a, acts in, in um, he supported acts in just becoming who they are. So, you know, in you know, in America, America's very different to any other place I've been to when it comes to university. They didn't diagnose, no one knew I had dyslexia, but it was almost like I'd moved to an environment where even if you had dyslexia, we work around yeah, that. I just felt yeah, yeah. it was I had different friends who were supportive in university. So in a way, I was able to, to, to I was I probably could have been a first class if I had diagnosed with dyslexia I, I would have graduated first class that's how much education was so much easier in America mm. but I still had the I wouldn't say anxiety I was very shy and mm. I thought how do I overcome this is by putting myself in front of it so I, I joined the local radio station the school radio, oh. radio station I was a DJ and so talking over the um, talking while we broadcast our show was a way of um, of just confronting my anxiety. Another thing I did was I ran for student body president on the university, and um, and I won twice, you know, two years in wow. a row. And um, and st so standing in front of the students and and, and saying, "What are your issues? We're going to handle that." So this was how I overcame my anxiety, but still loved music, and I started to think wouldn't it be great. And so I had no idea about wanting to get a career in, in, in music, but um. We had a career counselor who came to the school and he talked about finding your passion in your career. And he says, imagine if you were um, a god, if you love being in a garden and you had a job working at a garden centre. I mean, would that be work? You'd be. So I just realised, well, I love music. So why don't I try and get a job working in that industry? And that's, sorry, this is all types of music or a particular genre? Um, no. So mainly at that point, it was mainly R&B. Um, okay. So I think if the ones who are more popular now, if you think of maybe someone like 
R. Kelly, Black Street, mm. um, Boys to Men, but the um, new edition. So this is, and there's a t particular era. So this was late 80s, um, yeah. mid 90s, where the R&B music was very much, very, very strong, Aaliyah, TLC. So um, yeah. I was really into that genre of music and I could see it, I could understand it. I knew how to promote it and sell it. But by this time I'd moved to Wisconsin, which is, which is like in the middle of America, and it's and um, and, and uh, yeah. I Give us know. the English equivalent. What's Wisconsin in the UK? Uh, it's like Leicester, the Barnsley. Barnsley, okay. Yeah, it's like, I'm with you. Now yeah, we understand. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like we were to Barnsley. It's like where's Barnsley? Can't kind of think. So yeah, 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 yeah. So and you want to get, try and get a career working in London. You, you know, it's like you know, you, you it's, it was just so far away, and so. Um, I probably wrote about 500 applications towards my end of my career, uh, university to try and get into the industry, but it's either New York or LA, and I'm, I was neither where, neither, neither place. And in those days, the, the music industry, they didn't need to get a college graduate because they get people who come and work for free. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. you, you know, to come and say, that, yeah, I want you to pay me, you know, 30000 dollars a year to learn how to work in the industry was like <laughs> we can get it. a phd guy for free to do twice as much work for nothing so why would you so and i did of course i didn't i was trying to and, and the end the entertainment industry is very much um you start from the bottom you work your way up you don't yep. come out of university from you know work your way in management and come across and say this is how we do it um and so i had to i still you know well, in university, I was working at um, at a record store. You know, I just wanted to be around music. I wanted to be around labels. I just wanted to soak it up. I had thousands of CDs back when you had CDs. Mm. Um, but yeah, I had to get a job and um, earn money um, and start have music more of a, as a hobby. I thought you might be more vinyl back in the old days. You know, so my dad. My dad. I think he still has it, but he had a great collection of vinyl. You know, all the all the Bob Marleys and and fellas and stuff like that. I, and um, but for me, no, it, 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 you know, I think when CDs came out, it, it, to me, I used to love reading the the credit notes, like the to know who the writers and the engineers and the studios are, just so I could I could hear a track on the radio and first five seconds I could tell you, oh, this person produced it, this person wrote it. I could, could pick up everything. That's how my ear was for it. Okay. Well, this is a perfect time. I'm going to give you three seconds on a countdown using my hands. In three seconds, you're going to give me your favorite song of all time. Okay. No time to think. Three, two, one. So, favorite would be um, Michael Jackson's Lady in My Life off the okay. Thrill album. It's and a, why? It is, it is such a. Um, Unfortunately, he didn't write it. It was written by Roger Tevinson, who wrote Thrillums. But it, it is it is probably his best song that he's ever written. It is it is it is it is such a, a, a romantic call about this 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 ideal woman. Um, but it's so good of a track that I I, I don't listen to it more than once or twice a year. Let's keep it special. It, it it is like that type of I mean there's certainly you know, I mean so it is that 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 special that I can't I don't just listen to it anyhow I just yeah. like I so that's my favorite all time track. Um, Thank you very uh, much. Now we're talking about relationships and we're talking about special people. <laughs> I um I hear you have a bit of an iffy past with the women, no pun intended. So let's get on to the real rock behind you, the the woman who's made you the man you are today. Let's talk a bit about your wife, Iffy. Okay. How did you meet her? How did you meet her? And how has she helped you and blessed you in your life? I want to hear about the oh, story good. of Iffy, the romance. <laughs> um, yeah, no, she, um, 2006, um, my cousin in, um, my cousin, uh, Chi Chi, um, actually, was she, has Chi Chi started to stay with me? Yeah, and so my cousin calls me and says, "Look, she's got her best, a good friend of hers who they work together in Nigeria, who is planning to move to the UK." Right. And is and you know and um, generally when you come to a country you don't know anyone, it's good just to have you know someone that you could look up to, call up, 
And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, not, not a problem. And so that's how we got introduced. So my cousin um, introduced. And so first time I saw her, I think two, I think a month later, um, I, I think of my birthday. Um, and she, so she came down, she'd been here for about a, a couple of weeks or a month and she came down for my birthday. And at least I was able to, you know, just say, look, if you need any help around here in, in the UK and stuff like that, you know, just, you know, while you're here, so that's how that's how we met up and um and so she lived in the east east part of of london and mm -hmm. um and i and i lived i was living in in, in hammersmith fulham so quite a distance commute wise but every now and then if i was having a party or stuff she would come around and i believe the following year 97 my uh, 2007 my cousin who introduced us came here and uh, she, she had a, a son here and stayed with me for about three, four or five months. And so, it's, you know, if you would come down a lot and stuff. So we would develop a very good friendship. So East meets West. East and meets West. <laughs> <laughs> Ify, are you this, this shy, nervous guy when you're, when you're conversing with her? Or are you the confident Nandy we know now? Which, which Nandy came out yeah, the, I, in, the, in the wooing process? Yeah. <laughs> I or think did Ify take, say, grab you and no. say, come on? <laughs> no. I think... I think moving to the UK in itself um, ha had its challenges because I, I hadn't, um, yeah, moving to the UK had its challenges because I, I was very much in love with being in America and, and, and mm. about a career in there. But it was um, as, as, um, as, a, as, a man of, uh, as a man of faith, it was something that I felt it was something that I needed to relocate here. But as much as I can admit it now, it wasn't easy back in those early days. So, mm. um, and, and coming here, I was also then trying to start my restart my um, career within the music industry. So I'm you know, working with um, at Future Proof Records, and I was trying to still trying to set up my own music business while I was here. So, wow, I think there was a there was this part of of a identity called what am what am I here to do? What am I going to do? And so, by the time Ify came over, there's a lot of me who was focusing on career and, and and setting myself up and and then realizing okay you know as much as these ambitions are going i'm having i need to <laughs> need to settle down i need to get a job i need to get a place i'll stay with my my my, my loving cousins um some my in, in west london so i needed to move out i need to get my own place mm. so I was so that <clears throat> so at that point yeah so there was a lot of changes so yeah so by the time um but i, I was but i was it's always a person of relationships and friendships and and, and stories mm. and stuff like that and and one of the things that she from the from the beginning she was she was very much um you know i was i was very good at cooking and she would come learn how to you know either i'll cook um and um but she was the most organized person and my mum was staying with us for a couple of came with me for a couple of months and she'd come as well to visit and help help out a lot and stuff like that so I saw it really as a good friend and like a like a like like a sister uh, as well so when did it when this friendship when did it convert into romantic or did it just happen naturally and gradually yeah no I think come on Andy we want to know the lines <laughs> you used come on how did you win her over no I, I think for me I think there was you know there, there are times when you are you 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 you're not sure what you're looking for you know there are times when you're th focused on you, you have a, a sense of um this is what i want to do this is what i want to achieve this is who i need and everything and you you you, you put it together like okay this is what i this is the kind of person that I, you know what i need and, and you don't know yourself as well and mm -hmm. you don't notice who's in front of you um until you're like wait a minute everything that i keep thinking that i'm looking for and i'm, I'm looking is 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 here but what's um when, you, when you're busy you organize your everything and and i think at, there's a there's a time when the when this penny is it, i think they said these are the penny drops or the shoe drops or penny drops i think that's what it is when it's like wait a minute and um it's almost like one of these i don't know if it's a disney movie or one of these movies where you know you start that you have the flashbacks and you start thinking about all those moments keep coming in and say yes 
this is the one. What am I thinking about all this time? And then you can, you do your you you and you slow motion you start running and stuff like that. And um, yeah, and um, and I and and because I was so sure and so certain, um, I um, <laughs> I was very I didn't try and do the like oh let's go for the because we used to go out you know so when you're friends, it's, quite, it's quite challenging because you know she's coming for dinner i'm cooking we're going to the movies and it's very much friendship stuff so when then you're trying to turn it over you can't you've got to take the risk you have to almost say this is it yeah without trying to beat around bush because it becomes awkward if you just say hey you know how are you doing today but you're like oh, where's this come from so i just yeah, do you think if if he had always seen you as a friend or do you think she'd seen you more as a long-term target or did she say the same just friendship turned into relationship no I, I, I it's hard to say if um it's hard to say if she, she, from day one she'd always seen me in 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 in, in that mode i think um i think in a sense um it might have come as a surprise from from me, um, and it took time, her time to adjust to it and say, "Okay, you know, let's let's go down down this road." And um, but I think within two weeks of talking to her, I proposed. So it wasn't like a wow. yeah. So it was. I think I remember it was um, uh, on the twenty sixth of December, um, oh eight yeah proposing so it was it was for me it once once i once it hit i spoke it was the two weeks um so that was yeah so it, yeah because it, it was it was the one thing i've always said that um i've always known that if i make a commitment it's, I, it's only going to do it once and, mm. and 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 once i'm ready i know and so I, it was that that was it that and was so, it Yes. Yeah, so. Now you're a powerful orator, so I'm sure you, the salesman brought her in easily. But something I want to pick up on, earlier on you mentioned faith. You said your faith. Yeah. Now, I know you as a man of faith, but how did this faith come about? I know Nigerians are probably born as Christians, <laughs> you know, coming out straight from the womb. Is, but I know it says in the Bible about being born again. So yeah. can you tell us a bit about your experience of coming to faith? Yeah, I mean, if I, I went back and mentioned that we were born and raised in Liverpool, and, and uh, we, 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 um, my parents got married in Liverpool Cathedral. Mm. At the time, it was the third largest cathedral in the world. It's a massive one in out in Liverpool. We, we, my brothers and I were all baptized and christened at, at the cathedral. That was our church. It's, mm. um, it was probably the most magnificent, magnificent building you can be in, but one of the most dead vid building <laughs> services it was very much uh you know when the sermon started we had you know we go to kids stuff it was the most boring thing to go to it was, it was old school cathedral yeah, yeah yeah um but when we moved to you know and that's when we moved to nigeria my parents um started I doubt off, there could be a boring nigerian <laughs> service surely not. well they they started to go to a cathedral the biggest one in lagos right. um at first because they wanted to keep up with it and status nigerians about status so it was like okay we're here former president is there some the governor's here so that's that's what it was like but i think yeah. eventually they um they started to their walk with god started to get close and different and at the time they started to go into different fellowships and i also had some really good friends who are also christian and boarding school that's one of the things okay. that happened to me personally was um in boarding school um I remember my first year, they um, they're like they said, "Oh, there's a free movie that we're we're putting on for for the uh, first year students," and I oh, yeah, I couldn't. Well, oh goodness, free movie in boarding school. That's great. And they put on a movie called um, Left Behind. <laughs> right. It's 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 a, it was a nineteen sort of an eighties movie of um, you know the raptures happened, God is right. taking his chosen people and those who are left behind. <laughs> beaten and persecuted by the enemy uh, by by you know the 666 it was the scariest thing i'd ever seen and i was like what i didn't know about this and after yeah, yeah. the movie they're like so who wants to be uh, born again yeah. <laughs> so yeah. over, over each other like yeah sign me up sign me up and <laughs> <laughs> that's how i gave so the, like on the fear of the lord had been yeah, it, was the fear. Awesome, it was unfortunate because um 
after you know after a while the, the fear disappears and you're like oh okay you know so that was it, it, yeah so it got me in but it didn't keep me in um mm. but as i said my parents my dad used to go to full gospels businessmen breakfast my they were going to pentecostal churches so i had a very good friend who um who was also who I lived close to, who was also very much committed and teaching me stuff. So I think along the ways I was learning and, and getting close to God. And um, but America was um, a prodigal son kind of moment for me, kind of kind of moved away and did my own thing. And towards the end is where there was a sort of a, a reconnection. And, and that's had been my sort of journey since my last years in America to to my present days right. now. Well, it's really like the film Coming to America. You just lived it out. So <laughs> you've got the wife, you've got, you're in London, you've got your, uh, your you, you're doing your music, it's kind of semi-working out, so you're, not, you're getting your sensible job. And let me guess, Blackso Smith Klein is coming up. Yes or not? <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, yeah. So I, I met you when you were at Glaxo Smith Klein, um, yeah. facilities manager, is that right? Yes, I, 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 yeah, I was working in, in, in that department. Um, I was very much um, sort of change. So, you know, um, I was, I was, yeah, so I was doing a lot of process improvement, sort of stuff like that within, within the building. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, if there's a problem around stuff, I'll look at it, look at the processes and see how we can improve and modify, very working with 100 customers that were business clientele within the within the office the head office out near near he towards heathrow yeah um so i was there for a good seven years and and they did have um, a workplace fellowship there that i joined it was the first time i'd been in a work environment I, and as i said i lived in america for over 10 years and and, and as spiritual as christian as the country is working church was they're never, never going to match the uk yeah you didn't see that so it was very strange coming to a building and having people having service and and that was really a good change for me. Um, and actually, strangely enough, before I actually joined the fellowship and before we met at, at St. Paul's, I used to go to a church called Jesus House, which was very much 3,000 people, but mainly black Africans, um, mainly Nigerians and other black Africans. So, uh, and I think when I moved to the UK, I, I started to, for the first time in a long time i started to associate more with you know I, I, there's something about the country that i, I if, if you'd seen me in, in in america most of my if i had pictures if you see any of my pictures most of the people i hung out with were very much um diverse whites mainly um I, hardly any 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 nigerians i mean i had friends who were different color but i was very much diverse and i I moved to the UK and I was very much hanging around people from Nigeria culturally and mm. um, and even going to a church like that and and I, and I and I think God was saying look you know this is it, it has its limitations if you're trying mm. to reach and be you know you need to move and that's how Eve and I when we got married we decided to to, to find a church on St Paul's but um, mm -hmm. But then it did help when I went to GSK that I could, could be in, in a fellowship with people from different cultures and backgrounds and religions and, and not have to be the dominating Nigerian Pentecostal person in there. Yeah. So I've always known you as a bit of a sort of pioneer who sort of, you know, goes beyond race and background. And you, you, you've, you've, as you know, you've gone out to areas that perhaps are not black strongholds like Kent and you moved out, out to the, the countryside and you went to St Paul's which uh, there were probably one or two or three black faces in the early days when we went there mm. so you, you've obviously not afraid to get out there into different kind of cultures or different climates and and you know just be yourself which is I've always admired about you so you're at GSK um, and then you did the men's you know fellowship group there then you met two very charismatic and uh, handsome Christian men, myself and Chris Cook and Alice and Al Lewis, and you started doing the men's ministry. Do you want to tell us a bit about that at St Paul's? What, why, why do the men's ministry? What, what's the point of that? You know, I, I think there was a part of me that I, I could feel that, and it's just strange because it's not, I don't have that burning now, but when I was there, I could feel that as much as, say, the, 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 the lead of you know, Simon Male and and, the, and the, the other pastoral staff. There was Mark Parley. There was Keir. There was um, there was Ash um, at at the time. 
and then it was Viv and there's a lot of other men, but it, it there was a there was a sense that the men would show up on a Sunday and the women were doing would, would be the ones really engaging. And that's that's what I got that sense that that was happening. And and I just felt that the strong pull that 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 the men needed um, needed to have a connection, a personal connection, and so. But you, one of the things you realize is that you have a vision, but it's not the full picture. And in order for the full picture to be uh, recognized, you need to you need to learn. And this is my early days of learning about collaborative collaboration, where God was saying, "Look, you need to work with other people who have." A similar vision but a very different outlook so you can if you put a jigsaw together you have one piece and they have the other piece and so meeting up with yourself with with al um who had different so you were very much in the the sports side of ministry and the adventure and the outdoor sort of physical side um al was very much in his um there was a very a teaching he had i think it was called was it wilderness or call to wilderness i can't remember what that's it was. right yeah, yeah yeah something yeah so he was very much on, on that weekly teaching of, of, about men bonding and stuff and i was very much on simplifying what the gospel says so i did a lot of the you know the, the breakfast sort of talks um mm -hmm. you know the organizing this is a bigger picture so we had the annual sports day sports thing yeah, um, that's that's brilliant. A Smith Klein. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're using sports ground there. So very much, um, on that. Just making very simple. And the abseiling down from the tower. Yeah, the abseiling. Yeah. So it, we, yeah, we. So, but uh, but it was just one part of a bigger picture. So we all, you know. So it was really great working. Um, yeah. So it was really great to get bonding and and and, and having something like that and really was selling it differently. You know, just making guys. And, that, and this is before knowing about mental health and stuff, but giving it, creating a forum for guys to really talk and, and be open and stuff. And, you know, if I knew then what would I know now, I think I probably would have encouraged more of it. So more of a space and maybe probably less activities, but more engagement and talking. But I think you needed the activities to get people out. I don't know if we have any more talking from you, Nandy. <laughs> so anyway, so we're, and you've done again a nice, use your quote, a nice what? <laughs> that's a quite segue on, segment, segue on to uh, uh, mental health so we know you now you're in kent you're married you've got lovely children um going to fantastic schools in the area not the best schools but some schools in the area and you're uh, now in a new career no longer at gsk and you feel i guess called or you've moved into a different type of work you tell us about that yeah you know i think one of the over time, I've always looked at if I go back to when I was in school and they said, find a passion, a career and make a career out of it. And I looked at all the careers I had. So when I was in, 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 in the U, in the US, I, I mean, in LA working in, in, um, an account management and, 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 you know, sales or recruitment or working in, in, in facilities management, GSK or music industry. And, and what, tied everything was always the relationship it's always about that relationship and i'm and, and i'm if you remember me talking about being macgyver being able to here's a problem how do we find a solution so it, i realized there was always a part of me that like to fix i like to listen hear the story and try and offer solutions and um but i, I just i didn't i didn't i couldn't put them all together i just knew the bits and pieces so in um, i think 2013 or so i had a job opportunity at, you know redundancy out at gsk and it was like a chance to have a look at what do i want to do next and when ed with my my oldest son um, was starting school and um so i had time off so i took him to school and um you know first day in school and i was at pta um and and i and i volunteered and i became i think the class rep along with um um someone we both know becky drake who we, mm -hmm. our kids started to school at the same time so I, I i was like wow school being part of that and taking a lot of my work and bit, uh, stuff into organizing uh, and so that was my first sort of dab working within the school setting and after the time when it came to okay let's start looking for new work um it was when you um i wasn't sure still wasn't sure and you gave me that opportunity to to come shadow you at your school um 
and um, it was a little bit more challenging than I expected, but it was almost like, wow. Look at the hell off. Yeah. <laughs> so this is where it's really started, just getting into school and working with kids and stuff. And, and I did yeah. some youth work before. So, um, and I think the more I got into it, um, working in different schools and moving around, um, I, I then decided to take a career, um, go back to do a master's in, in counseling. And, um, and that's probably, that's where I got my diagnosis of dyslexia, actually, because they were like, I said, I'm still having the same problems I had in secondary school. What's going on? And they did assessment and stuff. But while, So not bad for the boy with dyslexia to end up with a master's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but while doing the master's um, you need, in counselling, you needed to be in a work environment. So I got a job working at a mental health institute, a hospital in East London. Mm. So I went straight into the deep end. So I actually saw people who were, who, who were sectioned and, wow. and of course I'd never known about mental health. And here I am working in, you know, as a, as a support worker in, in a mental health institution, both with men and female. And it was, I'm like, wow, psychosis, um, people talking, people, violence, borderline personality disorder, depression, people that wanted to kill themselves. And I'm watching it and seeing it and learning from it firsthand and I was like wow this is this is this is amazing but un unbelievable and then I also saw the, the differences because the ma many people many of the people I saw working that, as patients were black and Asians more like myself and I'm thinking but but then I'm hearing that most of the people who get into therapy were, were white and so I started realizing that there was a there's a there's a lot of disparity between how we within the black and Asian community were we're going and seeking help early on, but we were the most, um, we were given, we we're most likely to be locked up and be given the most um, harmful form of treatment or medication um, as well. Yeah, so that's how, it, it was almost like by accident, I hadn't planned to do it, but it's, as I started to go in, I started to want to explore more and stuff. And and I think eventually, I, I, working with adults, I realized, you know what, I wouldn't say it's a lost cause, but I realized that Late. I wish it would be easier to meet them before they got here. If I'd seen yeah. them when they were younger, we could do something about it. Uh, and I was inspired by a girl who was about 24, who got a job working in the city. She was probably making over 200,000. She came from a very privileged family, but she had a lot of issues with her dad and it affected herself and she was very suicidal and I was working with a home treatment team and we were going to do a sort of a daily checkup and give her make sure she has a medication and I sat down with her for almost 40 minutes and 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 she was just telling her story about how challenging it was growing up in secondary school and not getting the support there and I felt like I wish I had known her then I could have helped her before she got to the stage and that's when I decided I need to work in cams with younger kids and, and really stop them from turning into what she's turned into uh, and stuff. That's, that's amazing, really inspirational stuff. And you have also helped with a contribute to a mental health men's book um, and helped with the being on the panel there to help give your expert views on that, which is brilliant. And um, just as we're wrapping up, because I could talk forever with you, but it's coming up to an hour. We both have kids and wives who will shout at us <laughs> if we don't, we don't end soon. But, um, yeah, so we've had your favourite uh, song choice, but I know on your show you always ask people if they were trapped <laughs> in a lift or on a desert island like the beautiful island behind me. Okay. And we know your song. What would be the film? What would be Namdi's film of choice? So my favourite film of all times that I, that I always go to is um, Shinda's List. Ah, nice and cheery. Yes, nice and cheery. But I think it's the transformation of the man Schindler from a guy who started off caring about himself and making money to selling everything he had to save for other people's lives and the last scene when he's saying this ring could have saved 10 people and he's in tears and he saved a thousand people and he's like I could have bought more people with this I it, it's the I, well I well up every time I see that just seeing uh, redemption just seen transformation within the person and thinking they could have done so much more um it's yeah it's my all-time favorite movie and like the song I, I i can i don't i can't watch it too often because 
it's 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 a very special stuff. So I stack mm. it up, and then every time, and maybe every five years or something like that, I can bring it out and watch, have a good cry, and put it mm. back and say, okay, I need to be a better man. <laughs> well, Nandy, thank you so much for giving up your time. And I have to say, your story absolutely fascinating. I'm glad that you married Ify. I'm glad she organised you and put you on that nice straight path. Yeah, um, I'm glad you've done all these so rich, so many different types of jobs. And all those experiences have obviously made you into the man you are today, haven't they? And constructed you into this this guy who cares about others. And like Shalinda, is now giving up your time to help young people basically get back on track. The one thing I can always say about you is you've always had time to listen. You've always had good advice, and you're a very godly man who, I think, you know, prays into what you're going to say. You really think about how you can encourage or speak into people's lives, and that's a great thing. Nandi, I'll let you go, and thank you for allowing me to interview you for a change. Well, it's just uh, taking me by surprise. I was, uh, <laughs> I was surprised. To, I, I thought I had a guest who was planned on, but I guess you popped in, and uh, yeah, it's been, it, it's been strange. I never thought I was going to had had there was there was going to be this much of an open book, so it's been a surprise for me as well. Hi, you're a natural. <laughs> Man, you ready? Yeah. Concentrate. Let's Concentrate go, y'all. Concentrate with me. Oh, 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 oh. What you said? We do uh. this day by day. Yeah. We live like this because we got it, y'all. Every day I pray.